Most of the time, uh, as you might have heard, I do these kind of things from a philosophical perspective. So I look at kind of metaphysics and personal identity and questions of ethics and that kind of stuff. Today I'm actually going to be doing very little of that, partly because there's an opportunity for it in the Q&A and you've probably heard a lot of that anyway, but please do feel free to ask about it. Um, and in case anyone is wondering, I can send the PowerPoint slides out to anyone who wants it and we can get those sent out. Um, you don't have to ask, no worries about that. So just as a kind of note about the content, I will be discussing uh, abortion, obviously it's the title of the talk, um, but that will include a description of abortion, which is quite graphic, but essentially just accurate. Um, but it won't include images or videos. I do think images and videos are important in these discussions because I think they reveal truth about abortion and about the unborn child, uh, but I'm not going to be using them in this talk. Um, so I want to kind of look at this from two angles, and these can kind of be summed up into two ways we should talk about pro-life issues, talk about them in discussions, in debates, uh, to media, to friends, whoever. And the first thing that I want to say that we need, that I assume most of us already know, and most of us already practice, I think, uh, is compassion. Well, what is the reason for this? Well, one of the reasons is that it's such a common issue. There's about 190,000 abortions in the UK per year, and that amounts to about one, or one in three or one in four women in their lifetime. So virtually any context we're in, there will be women there who will have had abortions, there will be men there who have pressured people into abortions or facilitated abortions or paid for abortions, or who have had a child uh, killed through abortion. And on a global scale, this is obviously an even bigger problem. There's about 50 to 60 million abortions on a global scale each year. I'm not gonna say much more about abortion internationally other than to note the essentially sexism of the abortion industry internationally. So this is uh, a kind of project by the United Nations looking at the problem of the missing girls. And the United Nations say there are about 120 million women missing from the world today through sex selection. And if you look on their website, it will tell you this. It says around 126 million women are believed to be missing around the world, the result of sun preference and gender biased sex selection, a form of discrimination. Now, what they miss in terms of this description is that it's almost all due to abortion. The reason we have 120 million missing women today in the world is because we have sex selective abortion. Women don't just disappear when they're not wanted, they're killed when they're not wanted and they're usually killed in the womb when it's convenient and when no one puts up a fight. And because of that we have a world missing 120 million women, two times the population of the United Kingdom. That's an enormous number. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to say about the global problem, that this isn't a problem of pro-life as being misogynists. This is pro-life as actually protesting something that causes the death of 120 million women uh, since abortion has become popular in the last few decades. One of the other reasons we need to be compassionate about this issue is because actually it's not about choice at all. And we can see this when we look at the statistics, we can see this when we ask stories about abortion, we can see this in many numbers of ways. But coercion by partners, by family, by friends, often by doctors even, is very common uh, in medical situations. And I've heard many, many stories of people who have been to doctors and the doctors have recommended abortions. This is completely against professional guidelines for abortion to be recommended. It's meant to be presented as a choice at most, but actually I've heard many stories from parents who said that they were recommended abortions by doctors. And if you look at surveys, this is borne out. So about 64% of women, according to one study, felt pressurized. Up to 52% felt they needed more time to make the decision. 23% of women said one of their main reasons for having an abortion was that their partner didn't want the pregnancy and that most of these were for social reasons. But in fact, if we look at abortion providers, we see the same problem. So many people who have been working at Planned Parenthood, the main abortion provider in the United States, have said that their clinics had targets for numbers of abortion sets. And this is something that we see in the UK as well. The CQC, which is kind of like the Ofsted for healthcare providers, uh, they just are a neutral independent body looking at healthcare regulations and looking at hospitals to see how well they're living up to the standards. They did a report on Marie Stopes, which is one of the uh, primary abortion providers in the UK. And they found that the staff at Marie Stopes also felt that there were pressures and targets for abortions. That the staff felt that the number of abortions they facilitated was a performance indicator. Their performance was judged by how many abortions they encouraged women to have. 
and they actually found a company-wide policy across the nation that if a woman went to Murray Stopes and decided after all she didn't want an abortion, she changed her mind and she went away, there was a nationwide policy of calling the woman up again and asking her to reconsider. And this is obviously common globally in other countries, the pressure to have abortions. And of course, one other reason that one other way that women are encouraged or pressured or coerced to have abortions is that simply through misinformation, they're not presented of the risks. They're not told what can happen. I had a woman in my own practice, uh, obviously can't name her, can't say much about her, but she came in and she was suicidal. She was uh, abusing various substances. She, her life was in a complete mess. And I asked her, as any doctor would do, if there was anything that might have prompted it. Often these things aren't prompted. Uh, depression can happen on its own, but sometimes there is a trigger. Sometimes there is something that prompted it. And I just asked, is there anything? And I didn't ask for any reason in particular. I just said, was there anything at all? And she immediately just said, yeah, many years ago, I had an abortion. And I asked her, did anyone tell you that you could have you know, any negative mental health effects? Did anyone tell you that you could have any guilt or any depression or anything like that from abortion? And she said, no, not at all. Women are simply not told about the risks of abortion, which we'll get onto later. So to give you an overview of what the problem is like in the UK, this is a kind of summary of why abortions are carried out according to the law. In the UK, abortion is not available on demand technically. Uh, you have to fit certain legal criteria, though in effect, it means that up to 24 weeks of gestation, someone can have an abortion for essentially any reason, including because it's a baby girl or a baby boy. And we think this probably does happen. Um, after 24 weeks, it's much more difficult to obtain ab an abortion in the UK, and it has to be essentially for reasons of uh, a risk to the mother's life or what they call uh, a serious risk of serious fetal abnormality, and we'll get to that in a little while. So in terms of the numbers of these, 98% of abortions in the UK, uh, which amounts to probably about 180,000 out of 190,000, uh, are performed before 24 weeks for what they say are physical or mental health reasons. Um, Actually, mental health reasons is 99.8% of those, and usually it's not any kind of characterized mental disorder because there's no kind of mental disorder specifically associated with pregnancy that these uh, doctors are supposedly trying to avoid. And so the threat of mental disorder they describe as mental disorder not otherwise specified. They literally just say mental disorder. There's nothing specific or genuine um, or, or well characterized about it. We'll come to that again in a moment. One to two percent, almost all the other abortions are performed for what they call serious handicap, and we'll get to those in a moment. Um, only about 99 at most, or 100 at most, in the last few years per year, are performed to save the life of the woman. Um, and actually, many of these aren't where the woman's life is at risk, but where there's a risk of grave permanent injury. So that's a kind of maximum limit for the number of abortions performed because the woman's life is at risk. And one of the things I want to just highlight here is that often pro-life people talk about late-term abortions because it's obviously much more graphic, it's obviously much more stimulating, and it's something on which there's a lot more agreement because most people are opposed to late-term abortions. But this is usually dismissed because late-term abortions are supposedly rare, they're supposedly for very, very serious and extreme cases like the baby wouldn't survive after birth or the mother's life is at risk. Actually, the reality of this is that there are 3,000 abortions every year, roughly, performed after 20 weeks, and viability is about 22 weeks. So around the time of viability, there are still 3,000 abortions in, uh, in the UK per year, uh, which is obviously an immense number, a number that if it was applied to any other cause of death of babies in the UK, we would be absolutely mortified by it. <laughs> So let's turn to life-saving abortions first. As I say, there are fewer than 100 of these per year in the UK. And in terms of emergency situations, there's about one a year at most. It's extraordinarily rare. It works out to about one in 2,000 abortions. So absolutely the minority case. Um, in most of these cases, both the baby essentially is going to die anyway. These are tragic cases, cases that none of us wish we would ever come across. Um, but actually, there's very rarely a choice between the mother and the baby. Normally, we can only save the mother anyway. And that, for that reason, most pro-lifers think that we are allowed to not perform an abortion in terms of directly killing the infant, but evacuating the infant, knowing that it will sadly pass away um, in order to save the life of the mother, knowing that the baby is likely to die regardless of what we do. Um, 
As I said, this is actually legal in most countries around the world anyway. So in terms of the realistic debate about when abortion should be legal and about political debates and legal debates around the world, realistically, this isn't in question except for a very small percentage of countries where abortion is, uh, is not permitted even in that case. But in Northern Ireland, it's permitted if the mother's life is at risk. In Ireland, before the referendum, it was permitted and so on. In the most conservative countries, it's still permitted to save the woman's life. So this is something of a red herring. What about abortions for serious handicap? I said these were about 1% to 2% of abortions, about 3,000 per year in the UK. Um, these are actually increasing rapidly. So there was a parliamentary report a couple of years ago that actually showed if you look at the numbers of abortions performed on these grounds, it's increasing at an exponential rate. And this is something that has worried disability activists, disability campaigners, uh, quite rightly, because they fear that they're being screened out of the population, essentially. In the UK, about 80 to 90% of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome in the womb are aborted. Uh, in some countries, this is higher. So you've probably heard the statistic that in Iceland, it's tending towards 100%. Down syndrome is virtually eradicated in Iceland, but not by actually kind of talking to people with the condition or preventing some of the negative health effects that can come from that syndrome. It's simply through saying people with Down syndrome don't deserve to live and they don't have a quality of life that we would appreciate and so we should kill them. What many people don't know and what astounds most people I speak to about abortion for serious disability is that actually it includes things which are not at all serious. So you can be aborted in this country for the reason of cleft palate and about 10 of those happen in the UK per year. The Department of Health keeps statistics on the reason for every abortion. There are about 10 a year for cleft palate. And some of these don't even need to be proven. Even if there's just something of a risk of some of these conditions, that can suffice for an abortion in this country up until birth, perhaps even during birth, and we'll come to that. There are, of course, tragic cases where the baby is going to only live perhaps a few days, a few hours after birth, or perhaps will probably not even make it to birth. These are obviously immensely distressing cases. No one would want to have that diagnosis or have that revealed to them by the doctors or by the scans or by the blood test. This is an immensely distressing situation. But actually, a lot of the dialogue about these cases has been manipulated and kind of there's an assumption that women who are in this position actually overwhelmingly want to abort and actually that they would be better off from aborting. But in fact, if we look at the evidence, if we avoid headlines, if we avoid pro-choice kind of rhetoric and kind of heated debates that we see about this, we simply look at the evidence and we speak to people who have had these diagnoses and we ask them, what did you do? Were you glad you did it? And what were the effects of it afterwards? If you actually ask people who have diagnoses of the fetus having a life-limiting condition, about 97.5% say that they have no regrets about carrying the baby to term. And in fact, if you compare women in this situation and you compare the group that carry the baby to term with the group that abort the baby, the group that carry the baby to term actually have less despair, less depression, less avoidance kind of symptoms. The trauma seems worse. Obviously, these kind of diagnoses are distressing for anyone and they're difficult for anyone to go through. But if we look at the evidence, actually those who end up aborting, often because the doctors recommend it, simply because the doctors say you should do this, often many, many times in a row. I had one person came to me the other day and said five times in a row, different doctors said you need to abort this child. And he had it and the baby's fine. He's still alive. He's six years old today. The evidence suggests that actually, even in these immensely difficult situations, carrying the baby to term is actually usually better for the mother than having an abortion. I've spoken about the rare cases. These are immensely rare, especially the cases where the woman's life is at risk. What about the other 98%, the reason for the overwhelming majority of abortions in this country, at least 180,000? Well, of these 98%, 99.8% are for mental health disorder, not otherwise specified, as I said before. The reason it's not specified is because there is no evidence that abortion helps your mental health. And this is, in fact, conceded by virtually everyone. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, who are firmly pro-life, say that whether you have an abortion or you continue the pregnancy, your mental health won't be affected either way. All the major reviews say that there's no improvement in mental health seen from having an abortion. Literally no one in the literature appears to think that abortion is good for your mental health. And so the reason these uh, mental health disorder not otherwise specified is so that they can ignore that evidence 
and they can capture the real reasons that people want to have abortions, some of which are very serious and some of which are very distressing situations. Others of them are because they don't want to have a baby girl. And in fact, if you look at the law, and if you look at how the law has been interpreted, most legal scholars are agreed that having a sex-selective abortion in the UK before 24 weeks is legal. It's permissible, according to the law, to have a sex-selective abortion before 24 weeks. And in fact, when Parliament tried to ban this a couple of years ago, they voted it down. They said, we're not going to explicitly allow sex-selective abortion, but if you say that having a baby girl would be bad for your mental health, then we will allow you to kill it because it's a baby girl. That's what the law says. And that's what the law says not just about abortion, not just about this debate. That's what this law says about women that women are that much of a threat to mental health that they can be killed in the womb. This is a kind of a summary of one of the psychologists who works on this, this issue. Um, he's actually a pro-choice psychologist. He lives in New Zealand. His name's David Ferguson. And this is in one of the kind of uh, top psychiatry journals around. He says, there is no credible evidence to support the research hypothesis that abortion reduces any mental health risks associated with unwanted or unplanned pregnancy that come to term. But in fact, there's quite strong evidence now growing that points the other direction, that abortion is actually associated with increases in anxiety and alcohol misuse, in illicit drug use and suicidality especially. And these results are actually relatively concrete. And the re most recent review conducted by David Ferguson, who is a pro-choice psychologist, a professor of psychology in New Zealand, the most recent review, which the ARCOG hasn't taken notice of yet, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, so far have ignored this review. That review shows actually the latest data and the latest research and the best studies show, in fact, that abortion is associated, even if you, com if you control for other factors. So if you control for factors such as prior mental health, you control for factors such as physical problems, you control for factors such as domestic abuse, and you say, suppose all of those are equal and the effect of those is kind of removed from the evidence. Abortion is still linked with increased risk of suicide, of alcohol use, of anxiety, and so on. And this suggests actually a causative relationship. And Ferguson says there is likely a causative relationship here. And as they say, women are most frequently not told about these risks at all. Another thing that's interesting here is that some of the risks often aren't seen in these studies because they only look at studies in the short term. They ask women maybe a month or so or up to a year or so after the abortion, how do you feel about it? And quite naturally, fairly soon after the abortion, a woman is relieved because she's made that decision and she's at least temporarily relieved from not having the unwanted pregnancy. But actually studies suggest that those negative emotions towards abortion increase over time. So that as you follow women up for years and years after, over that longer time, women become gradually and gradually more and more dissatisfied with their opinion. And these women are not looked at in these studies because they only look at the short-term consequences. I should say again on the theme of late-term abortions that actually many of these we can show from the statistics. Uh, many late abortions after 20 weeks, for example, are for these mental health reasons. They're not because the mother's life is at risk. They're not because the baby has a serious abnormality. The majority, in fact, of abortions after 20 weeks, if you look at the Department of Health statistics, are done for these mental health reasons, which is kind of the code for socioeconomic reasons in this country. What about mortality? What about this risk? I've spoken a little bit about the mental health risks. But it's often claimed that pregnancy itself is a risk to life. And in a sense, this is true. Pregnancy does come with unique risks. Sometimes, sadly, those can be fatal. Sometimes pregnancy can bring unique problems and unique changes in physiology that sadly mean the mother who has the baby passes away from them. And those are obviously, again, immensely distressing cases. But what's omitted from these discussions is that actually pregnancy also seems to mitigate other health risks that come from not being pregnant. And pregnant women, if you look at the mortality rates, have much, much lower mortality rates than non-pregnant women. Now, some of this, it is to be granted, is because women who are unhealthy in the first place are less likely to become pregnant, and we can completely appreciate that. But it does seem actually, and most scholars who look at this area of research seem to think that pregnancy, for various reasons, does seem to reduce risks of mortality. 
Reasons might be because pregnant women are more likely to look after themselves better, they're more likely to be monitored by health professionals, and so on. But the, risk, the, the comparison seems to be really real. And if we look at the numbers, we can see how substantial that is. The mortality rate during pregnancy is about 8 to 9 per 100,000 women in the UK. It's much higher in other countries. But by comparison, the mortality rate for an average woman of childbearing age who's not pregnant or who is either pregnant or not, but the average woman of the same age is 17.5 in the lower age bracket of childbearing age women, which is still about twice the mortality rate of pregnant women, or it shoots up to 144 at the upper end uh, of the childbearing age bracket. 45 to 50 is generally about the limit. Um, this is the very upper end, but you can see that the mortality rate for non-pregnant women shoots up much higher than the mortality rate for pregnant women. So it seems that pregnancy in many ways is actually much less dangerous, even though it does present unique risks to the woman who is pregnant. This is just a rough measure I did from looking at statistics in the UK, looking at mortality rates in the UK uh, for pregnancy and looking at general mortality rates in the UK. But actually it's been confirmed by more sophisticated studies. So this is one from perhaps one of the top obstetrics and gynecology journals in the world, the American Journal of ONG. And it says that the pr this was, because it was done a couple of decades ago, the mortality rate for pregnancy is considerably higher. But it said the mortality rate for pregnancy was 25.9 in 100,000. But for non-pregnant women, women who were never pregnant, it was much higher, it was about 57. And for abortion, actually, what happens really interestingly is that the mortality rate shoots up even higher. It goes way above even the mortality rate for non-pregnant women. The mortality rate for women who have abortions is so many times higher than the mortality rate for women who get pregnant. So yes, pregnancy has unique risks and obviously those can sometimes cause extremely tragic situations. But what we often don't hear about is the mortality risk from abortion. And this seems to be considerably higher by an order of magnitude. In some studies, six or seven times as high. And so actually, if we look at abortion as healthcare, if we look at it from a medical perspective and think, a lot of people say abortion is healthcare and that's why we need it. Well, we can maybe even grant that it's permissible. Suppose you think abortion is okay, that there's nothing morally wrong with it. There's still a question to be had is it healthcare? And if we look at it from that perspective, abortion gives you a higher risk of suicide. It gives you a higher risk of mental health issues. And in fact, abortion for physical health reasons is extremely rare. So in what sense is it healthcare? If any other surgical or medical procedure had these same risks or had these same kind of risks associated with them and conferred no benefits, uh, in this sort of way. Would we say that it was healthcare? Would we say that it was worth publicly funding? That seems to me very, very implausible. The second way that I think we really need to talk about this issue is in terms of truth. Compassion is one of the things we need to have foremost in our hearts, foremost in our minds, foremost in our speech. And it's obviously something, uh, as Stephanie was talking about, needs to come through in our stories, needs to come through in the way we speak to women, in the way we speak to men, in the way we speak to all sorts of people who are involved in these debates. But often that can be done at the expense of truth. And for me, as someone who has worked in medicine, who has seen abortion, who has seen the reality of unborn children, who has seen the effects of abortion on women, Truth is immensely important, and truth is important for choice. Truth should be important for all of us. Two stories to illustrate the, the issues we see here. The issue of truth and the issue of euphemism that we see in this debate. That sounds much better. Great. Um, this is a story from The Independent, a fairly liberal pro-choice newspaper in the UK just a couple of years ago, and it says, a woman has just been sentenced for the crime of abortion in the UK. This was a woman in Northern Ireland who had been sentenced uh, for procuring an abortion. And because it's a pro-choice left-leaning newspaper, the Independent phrased this as a kind of shocking thing. This is a bad thing. This is terrible that in the UK we have sentenced a woman for abortion. But in fact, if you look at the Independent just a couple of months before that, it said a man was char charged with child destruction over an attack on a pregnant woman in a London street. And then it goes on in the article to say the 21-year-old victim, who was 32 weeks pregnant, lost her unborn child. Does anyone here think that it would use the word unborn child in the previous article when the woman had an abortion? Of course not. Not a chance. But actually they were a similar stage in their pregnancy. 
In one case it's an unborn child, in one case it's not. The only difference is whether it's wanted. And so we can see that even these newspapers, even these media sources, which claim that pregnancy is just a case of having pregnancy tissue inside you, or products of conception inside you, or having a parasite inside you, actually it reveals the truth when it's being less careful. It says this is an unborn child, and this is something we all know. Likewise, Hillary Clinton, when she was trying to defend abortion rights, she said something which was at the same time pro-choice and pro-life. She said, the unborn person doesn't have constitutional rights. Now, of course, in America, if you are a person, you have every constitutional right. <laughs> but she thinks unborn people, unborn persons, don't have them. Likewise, Planned Parenthood, the abortion provider in the US, talks about a baby kicking up hope after surgery in the womb. If we look at the truth, if we look at the NHS website even, or just any embryology textbook, we see the reality of unborn life. We see the heart starts beating about three or four weeks after conception, extremely early on. The brain starts to take shape about a week later, and so on. This is the NHS website, which if you look at the section on abortion, I might have a slide of it, maybe not. Um, this one, maybe not, no. If you look at the NHS website, when it talks about abortion and what abortion does, it says it removes pregnancy tissue. That's what an abortion does at any stage of the pregnancy, it removes pregnancy tissue. This is the same website at a much earlier stage saying your baby at 10 weeks, your baby at 10 weeks. The ears are starting to develop on the sides of your baby's head, the ear canals are forming. If you could look at the baby's face, you'd be able to see an upper lip and two tiny nostrils in the nose and so on. The baby is making small jerky movements. It has no hesitation whatsoever about calling it a baby. No doctor denies this. Every doctor says this is clearly a baby when it's wanted. It's not a question of what the science says. It's not a question of what medics say. Everyone, the NHS, every doctor I speak to says this is a baby, except if it's not wanted. How is abortion performed? As I said, I'm not going to show any pictures. I'm not going to show any videos. But I do think it's important that we know the reality of this. And I hope it's safe to share this. And I'm sorry if it does. Uh, come across as insensitive in any way. Abortions are performed in medical cases, which is in this country maybe about 60 to 70 percent of abortions, by cutting off the blood supply, the nutrients, the oxygens to the baby, and then causing a miscarriage essentially, <coughs> inducing labor so that the woman ejects the baby um, and the baby dies that way. In terms of surgical abortions, they occur quite differently, and we're going to go through that. In early surgical abortions, the baby is vacuumed out of the womb because it's small enough to be vacuumed. But actually, when we look at later surgical abortions, of which there are about 3,000, it's a procedure called dilation and evacuation. This is something that, again, is a minority case of abortions. And people, when pro-lifers bring this up as a graphic way of illustrating abortions, say, these abortions are really rare. They're done on late babies. They don't really happen. They're very rare. They only happen for extreme reasons. Actually, the reality is dilation and evacuation happens about 3,000 times a year in the UK, many, many thousands of times a year elsewhere in the world. And actually, if you look at a recent uh, headline from the BBC, it said the doctors are being told to adopt a new policy of writing letters that are easier for patients to understand. <coughs> the problem with this is, it even goes on to say they should stop using Latin, we should stop using complex medical jargon, and instead we should use plain and simple English. We should say twice daily instead of BD, uh, which I don't think is a realistic prospect if you know doctors or if you've worked in hospital. But it's a nice aspiration to aim for. We should explain things in plain English rather than in Latin and in medical jargon. The problem with this is when you ask the NHS website to do the same, or if you ask abortion manuals about how people are supposed to do the procedure to do the same. In this case, the NHS website says a dilation and evacuation is done by inserting forceps into the womb to remove the pregnancy. Well, this is one way to put it. This is how the textbooks and the academic literature puts it. This is from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and it says a DE is performed by removing the fetus with forceps through the cervix and vaginal canal. Usually, disarticulation or dismemberment occurs as the physician delivers the fetal part grasped in the instrument. It, in this case, quite clearly says it's disarticulation, meaning dismemberment. This is another guide for clinicians on how to perform second trimester abortion. I'm not going to read it all out, but it says occasionally during the evacuation, the calvarium, that means head, can become trapped. If it cannot be grasped with the forceps, apply suction, gently insert the forceps, and so on. It is usually necessary to collapse the calvarium. 
Collapse the calvarium is that complex Latin medical jargon. It means crush the skull. It then says, examine the fetal tissue to ensure the evacuation is complete. Identify the fetal parts, especially thorax, chest, spine, calvarium, skull, and placenta, and so on. And then this is the really revealing part, I think. After the procedure, what does it say? It says, after the procedure, cover the fetal tissue to keep it out of the woman's sight. Why would it say that? Why would it say cover it to keep it out of the woman's sight unless it's trying to hide the reality? Because we know when we see the reality, even just reading about it, we're horrified, we're mortified. We keep it out of sight because we know that when people see it, they see the reality and it mortifies people. And I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that my own profession does this every single day. It does it all over their websites, it does it all over their books, it does it all over their literature. My profession distorts and dis guises and miscommunicates extremely the reality of what these procedures involve. As I said, sorry, it wasn't 3,000, it was 9,000 of these happen a year in the UK. Um, as I said, I'm not going to show images, I'm not going to show videos, but I do encourage people to have resources where they can look at these. Um, I check these videos and check these images, I discuss them with people who work in these areas of medicine, they say they look perfectly legitimate to me. There's a video at the top, abortionprocedures.com, which is a cartoonized uh, diagram of abortion explained by someone who used to perform thousands of them. On Abort 67, which is a uh, protest group protesting abortion in the UK, on their website they have graphic images of abortion, which, again, I've discussed with authorities on this issue who say to them it seems perfectly realistic, and the group do in fact threaten lawsuits against people who say that they're faked images. They're perfectly serious about that. All the evidence suggests that these images are in fact real. And one of my friends from this organization puts it this way, we don't actually protest abortion, we <coughs> show abortion, and abortion protests itself. Just a couple more facts of things that are often miscommunicated about this issue. I've got most of the kind of grisly, really horrific stuff out of the way, um, just to, to reassure you. Um, sometimes abortion is suggest, you know, there's this kind of objection to abortion saying, what about all those babies who would have to be taken to term and who would have to be given birth to? Who is going to adopt all these babies? Well, actually, if you look at the evidence and if you look at adoption of newborns, it's virtually impossible to adopt a newborn in the UK because there are so few of them. There are far more couples willing to adopt a newborn baby than there are people, uh, than there are babies who are available to be adopted. In The Independent, they, they spoke to someone about their experience giving a baby up for adoption, and it says demand for babies is so high that the adoption agency doesn't list its name in the yellow pages. Their fear is being swamped with calls. We just can't handle it. There aren't any more babies available, says a spokeswoman. <laughs> Who's going to look after all these babies if abortion is made illegal? It's obvious. All these thousands and thousands of parents want to have a baby and you don't have one. Another thing that is often lied about is this idea, I think, that abortion laws or pro-life laws don't limit abortions. Of course they do. Most laws don't absolutely eliminate any crime. That's not what laws are there for. Laws are there for a number of reasons, but one of them is to reduce the rates of something, even if it can't completely eliminate it. And the evidence on this, when people actually do the studies, is clear. This is a website, a secular pro-life website, and it has a couple of really good posts where it just lists a bunch of studies saying all these studies show that pro-life laws do reduce abortions. There's mountains and mountains of evidence. There are some studies that suggest the opposite, but I'm going to come to those in the Q&A if you really want to speak about them. Essentially, they don't show the opposite. They're very simplistic studies, and they're usually manipulated and used in ways that are really, really quite dishonest. What about backstreet abortions, a common objection? I'm trying to rattle through a lot of the common objections. We do have a huge Q&A tomorrow, so uh, any more questions you have, we'll be able to address some of those questions there. What about a backstreet abortion? Shouldn't abortion be legal so that we can prevent women getting dangerous abortions from illegal abortionists or from dangerous procedures? <coughs> This is a quote from Bernard Nathanson, who was the head of NARAL, or it's an American organization. I don't actually know how you pronounce it. Maybe NARAL, NARAL, I don't know. Uh, but they're essentially an abortion activist organization. And he used to be one of the heads in that organization when they were lobbying for the legalization of abortion. 
And then he later changed his mind and thought, actually, I'm going to be pro-life. I think unborn children really are unborn children and deserve a right to live. And he actually says that when he was at this organization, they lied about the number of people who were dying from backstreet abortions. He says, how many deaths were we talking about when abortion was illegal? We emphasized the drama of the individual case, not the statistics. But when we did speak of statistics, it was five to 10,000 a year. I confess that I knew the figures were totally false. But in the morality of our revolution, it was a useful figure, widely accepted. So why go out of our way to correct it with honest statistics? Likewise, Mary Calderon, who was one of the kind of medical directors of Planned Parenthood, the abortion provider in the US. Again, I'm not going to read it all out, but she says quite clearly at the point when abortion was being legalized, talking about illegal abortions, abortion is no longer a dangerous procedure. This applies not just to therapeutic abortions in hospitals, but even to illegal abortions. In 1957, for example, there were only 260 deaths in the whole country attributed to abortion of any kind, and so on. And says at the end, remember, abortion, whether therapeutic or illegal, is in the main no longer dangerous because it is being done well by physicians. And we can see this when we look at the statistics. There are about 19 deaths from illegal abortions in the USA in 1973, when abortion was legalized in the UK. In fact, if abortion were made illegal now, there would be far fewer even than that because of improvements in sanitation, improvements in treatment of abortion complications, and because many abortions illegally done would be performed medically, uh, in which case there are certain fewer risks that can more easily be alleviated or can be done by women. In fact, the abortion industry thinks medical abortions are so safe that they want women to take them at home. And they've been pushing for a campaign to have home abortions because they think medical abortions are really that safe. They're not, in fact, that safe. But that's nothing to do with their legal status. That's to do with the fact that abortion is not as safe as they say it is. And of course, if there were, if there were a law that provided amnesty and protection from prosecution for women, then these numbers of deaths from illegal abortions could be reduced even further because women could have could go to a hospital comfortably and say, I had an abortion, knowing that they were safe from the law, but knowing that they could be treated from those complications. So in 1973, about 50 years ago, 45 years ago, illegal abortions were relatively safe. There were very, very few deaths from them. These days, they would be much safer still, at least compared with legal abortions. But that ignores a huge aspect of this debate, of course. Of course, it ignores the fact that abortion is not just about the woman, but also about the child, and that every abortion, or almost every abortion, involves the killing of an unborn child. Every abortion has a mortality rate of at least one. But also, it ignores the fact that many abortions are safe, even are unsafe, even when they're legal. Is this playing up again? A little bit. Cool. I'll keep going for now. The risks from legal abortion are considerably greater than this, I think, and we spoke about that earlier. I spoke about the mental health risks, the risk of suicide, the mortality risk after abortion. I haven't worked out the statistics in detail, but I would be comfortable guessing that according to the most recent research, at least, that says that the risk of suicide, one of the leading causes of death of women of childbearing age in the country, given the risk of suicide from abortion, according to the latest research, probably more women are dying from legal abortion than they would be doing even from the illegal abortion in 1973. And I think probably far more women are dying from suicide related to abortion nowadays than would die if abortion were made illegal now. So just to kind of end off, uh, I said at the start I wasn't going to speak much about the philosophical arguments and I don't have much time left. And I think those things can be covered in future conferences. Obviously, all of you are welcome to come back, and we'd love to see you next year. Sorry, this is really playing up, isn't it? Do you have a? That's right. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, as I said, I'm not going to speak much about the philosophical, the philosophical arguments for the pro-life position. We can go through them. We can speak about them in the Q&A tomorrow. You can come to speak to me afterwards. There's plenty of resources that I can give you on those, and I'm not going to go into them in detail in this talk. But what I really want to encourage you with uh, is actually the idea that pro-lifers are not the extremists. And this is one of the things that you will come across most when you speak to people about these issues, when you speak in public, when you speak in friends. They see pro-lifers as the radical ones. And in a sense, those of us who hold to the idea that human life should be protected from the moment of conception, like myself, 
that is a minority position, and there's no point pretending actually everyone secretly agrees. It is a minority position, but it's not that much of a minority position. And when you compare it with the abortion industry's position, it's actually completely mainstream. Let me give you some examples. 77% of women, over three quarters, think that doctors should have a legal obligation to check that a woman is not being pressured into having an abortion. So most people, most women, think that a doctor should check before a woman has an abortion that she's not being pressured. There shouldn't just be an easy pathway. A doctor should check at least something first. Many of them think there should be a mandatory waiting period, as there is in other countries like Holland. 93% of women, almost everyone, thinks that women should have a legal right to independent counselling, financially independent counselling, so not from the abortion providers themselves. 70%, nearly three in four women, think that the abortion limit of 24 weeks in the UK should be reduced. Actually, most of the population think that the abortion limit at the moment is too far in the pro-choice side. Most people think the law should be more restrictive. And in fact, a good deal of those people think that it should be much more restrictive. 41% of people, of women, think it should be 12 weeks or lower, halving the abortion limit. Compare that with the people who think it should be kept as it is, only 17%. And only 1% of people think it should be extended up to birth. What a radical position that is. On the whole, if you look at these surveys, women happen to be more pro-life than men. So if you're a man who gets called out for, or called out for their position on abortion, just say, you're lucky you're not talking to a woman because they'd be more pro-life. I've, I've seen the statistics, I've seen the surveys, I can point you to the references. Women, on the whole, are more pro-life than men in the surveys. And 90% of the population oppose sex-selective abortion and think it should be explicitly prohibited by law. So 90% of the population think that should be prohibited. It seems like up to 99% of the population <coughs> think that really late-term abortion should be prohibited. So in fact, the basic pro-life position that some abortions should not be permitted and that the bodily autonomy of the woman is not absolutely paramount is a position held by about 90%, at least 90% of the population. Almost everyone in the country thinks that some abortions should be illegal. The question is just which ones. Skip that. On the other hand, if we look at the extremism of the other side, I think it becomes quite evident how much more extreme the other side is. Most people in the population have a quite moderate, in a sense, position on abortion. They're somewhere in the middle. They just don't speak up about it much because it's not an, an issue that they feel particularly passionately about. Those who actually endorse the extreme pro-choice position are in an overwhelming minority. So, as I said before, 1% of the population thinks that abortion should be legal up to birth. One in 100 people. I think it was actually 0.5% when I checked in more detail. An absolutely minority position. By contrast, the absolutely minority position of denying the Holocaust was shared by 5%. Denying the Holocaust is orders of magnitude more mainstream than the position that abortion should be legal up to birth. And yet abortion providers and abortion activists think that abortion should be provided up to birth, sometimes during birth, sometimes it seems after birth, as we've seen in the US recently. In terms of abortion during birth, I won't go into the details of this, but it's essentially a case where the baby is almost delivered and then killed by a brutal surgical method. This was banned in the US, but before it was banned in the US about 15 years ago, it was legal and it was commonly performed. Uh, it was performed on healthy babies and healthy mothers, often quite uh, late on in the pregnancy. And when they went to ban it, it wasn't just an easy case for the US government to resolve. Four of the Supreme Court judges thought that it should still be legal. Most Democrat politicians thought it should still be legal. The president of the time, Bill Clinton, thought it should still be legal. And so you have four of the judges of the highest court upholding justice in the land, the President of the United States, and a majority of the Democrat Party thought that partial birth abortion should be kept legal. This is truly, truly radical. Far more radical than any position you could even possibly hold as a pro-lifer. On this kind of front, in terms of recent developments, this is where it's going in England. There are moves to decriminalise abortion in England completely. There are moves to decriminalise it up to birth. Um, and there are attempts to do the same in Northern Ireland, who don't want abortion on demand at any point. If you look at polls of the population, none of them want abortion on demand, 
even up to a certain limit. And yet, what the abortion lobby is trying to do at the moment is to impose, override devolution, so that they can impose an absolutely extreme law, one of the most extreme laws in the world, on Northern Ireland against the wishes of the people. That is how radical the ideology is. And here's just an illustration of that, that in fact, the only countries in the world who allow abortion up to birth are North Korea, China, Vietnam, Canada, and parts of the United States. This is not thrilling company. <laughs> Goes without saying. Um, th of course, there are some wonderful Canadians, as we've seen in the last couple of hours. Um, but the, country, the country's law on this is truly radical. What the abortion lobby at the moment wants to do is take Northern Ireland, where people don't want abortion on demand at all. Most of the population in Northern Ireland do support some exceptions to the current law. They do think that abortion should be legal in some cases. But most people in Northern Ireland say abortion on demand at any point is wrong and they don't want it. The abortion lobby is so radical that it wants to take that population, override their democratic will, override what they believe as a country, and move it to 24 weeks to become one of the most extreme, extreme pro-choice regimes in the world against the will of the population. That is truly radical, and that is essentially imperialism. I'm going to finish there. I just want to say as a kind of basic note in terms of engaging with the philosophy. I've spoken for a whole hour on nothing to do with philosophy, so I apologize for any of you who are disappointed with that. I just want to say a quick note about where we can start debating these issues. And as I say, there are plenty more opportunities to learn more about this. But one of the most helpful points that I hope I've illustrated through looking at public opinion, through looking at all sorts of other things, is that almost everyone agrees that late-term abortion is wrong and should be illegal, that it shouldn't be a woman's choice, that the government should ban it. Almost everyone agrees that sex-selective abortion should be illegal, that it shouldn't be the woman's choice, that the government should ban it. Almost everyone in the UK thinks that some abortion should be illegal and that bodily autonomy isn't paramount. And that's a helpful starting point for these discussions. To actually not just start with your own position necessarily, but to ask the person in front of you, what do you think? I, one of the things not mentioned in the introduction, I work as an evangelist for a, a centre in Oxford where we look at difficult questions in Christianity and difficult questions in religion and try to answer them through intellectual answers. And one of the things we're told there is actually one of the most useful ways to communicate with people is just through asking them questions first. One of the first questions I ask people is, what do you think about abortion? Should abortion be legal up to birth? Is it okay up to birth? Is it okay during birth? Is abortion on the basis of it being a baby girl wrong? Should that be illegal? If you get them to say yes, which 90% of people do say, you're off to a good start because you've said, okay, there can be something which overrides considerations <coughs> of bodily autonomy. There are some times where we think it's not misogynistic to ban abortion because actually, unborn life has some value and it should be respected. And if you get them to admit that, at least from the start, you're onto some common ground and you can explain that your view is not a radically different misogynistic view where you don't care about autonomy. It's not a radically different view where you don't care about women. It's just a view that says, we think there should be more limits because we think that unborn, regardless of their gender, regardless of the reason for killing them, regardless of their age, is something that is worthy of protection. I hope I've managed to communicate some of that today.